But I'm excited about this new series that we're starting for the next four weeks that is entitled Christ Before the Line. And what we mean by that is we're going we're gonna to look at we're going to look at Jesus Christ before the line between B.C. and A.D. And uh, so this morning we're going to start with the seed of the woman. So we're going to go all the way back into the Old Testament. We're going to begin to see uh, Christ in these uh, you know, just prophecies of, of him. And so let's start with the seed of the woman. And we're going to begin all the way in the book of Genesis. Genesis 3, verse number 15 says this. It'll all be up on the screen as well. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the, this is the very first promise that is given in the Bible. And it's right after Adam and Eve had eaten the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. So it's the very first gospel sermon that has ever been preached on the face of the earth. These words, they were spoken by God, and they contain the first promise of redemption uh, that, that you will find in the Bible. Everything else in the Bible flows from that verse right there. Everything else in the Bible flows from that. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's kind of like an acorn that contains that mighty oak tree. Or as the uh, English preacher Charles Simeon called it, the sum and summary of the whole Bible. He called that verse the sum and summary of the entire Bible. Although you might not see at first glance Christ in that verse. You're saying, yeah, well, where, is, where is Christ in that verse? He is the ultimate seed of the woman who would one day come to crush the serpent's ugly head. It is in this process of crushing the serpent's head, his heel is going to be bruised while he's on the cross. In short, this verse predicts that Jesus would one day be victorious over Satan as he is being crucified on the cross and he's wounded at the same time. These words would be fulfilled thousands of years later at a place called Calvary, outside of the city wall of Jerusalem. But all of that was in the future when God first spoke these words. Neither Adam nor Eve could fully comprehend what God was saying when he was, in a sense, preaching this first redemptive sermon to Adam and Eve. So this morning, we're going to embark over the next four Sundays on the Christ before the line, meaning before the line between B.C. and A.D. And the very, the very title may seem like a contradiction because B.C. means before Christ. Now, our society can kind of try to change that all they want, but B.C. for all of these thousands of years have meant before Christ. Christ. And so one might think, how can we look at Christ before Christ? Well, we can if we realize that our Lord is the second person of the Trinity, being full of God in all aspects, existed long before Bethlehem. Jesus, the, the man, came into being with his conception in Mary's womb, but Christ, the Son of God, has exalted, has been, has, has been in existence, excuse me, from all of eternity. That is why our Lord was able to say and what He meant in John chapter 8, verse 58, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was even born, Jesus said, I am. He is claiming eternal existence with God the Father. That is why we should not be surprised to encounter Jesus Christ all throughout the Old Testament. Sometimes He actually appeared as the angel of the Lord. Or when Isaiah is uh, seeing a, a vision of God in heaven, we learn that that is actually Jesus 
that Isaiah when he said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Literally, he's speaking of Jesus there. But in a broader sense, the Old Testament bears witness to him through many symbols and images and also through direct prophecies of his coming to the earth. And so during uh, these weeks leading up to Christmas, we're going to look at four specific prophecies of Jesus Christ's coming. We're going to look this week at the seed of the woman from Genesis 3.15. Next week, we're going to look at the Lamb of God from the book of Exodus. And then the following week, we're going to look at the prophet like Moses from Deuteronomy. And then we're going to end on Christmas Day with Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 7 that Jesus Christ was going to be born of a virgin. Now, I've chosen those four because they represent kind of central truths that help us understand Jesus Christ and why he came and why it's so important and why we can't just allow the month of December to come and go where it doesn't impact us, where it doesn't affect us. We need to understand these prophecies. They have, they have great implications in our lives. And I pray and I trust that these sermons, that they're going to prepare your heart for Christmas, that they're going to increase your devotion towards Jesus Christ, the prophesied Son of God born in Bethlehem. That's who we celebrate this month. But before we kind of get into it, I want us to think about the context. We need to make sure that we understand the context of this prophecy of Jesus Christ right after Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit and literally plunged all of humanity into despair and fall in the fall. And so this is so important in the history of redemption that we need to understand this context. Let's start about let's start with the time and place. We begin with the observation that this verse takes place near the beginning, right, of human history. Adam and Eve, they've just eaten of the forbidden fruit. Sin has now entered into paradise. Their first impulse was to hide from God. And then once they get caught, they then blame shift, right? Adam is like, well, the woman that you gave me, this is the reason why I took of it. And then Eve said, well, it was because of this serpent. So they're immediately uh, just shifting the blame. You can read that earlier in chapter number three, the book of Genesis here. No one was willing to stand up and say, hey, it's my fault. I did it. I'm the reason why i would taken responsibility. Suddenly, paradise, it's not so beautiful. Eden now had sin entering into it. Dark shadows fall on the ground as Adam and Eve contemplate what they've done. The smell of death is now in the air because, Christ, because, because God had to, to kill an animal, to kill a lamb. And so the smell, the stench of, uh, of death is in the air. Under a nearby tree, the serpent lies quietly. He's alone. He's happy. He delights in what is happening, for this was the very plan of his from the fall, from the very beginning, once pride began to uh, spur up in his life. He intended to humiliate God by ruining paradise, and now he's done it. He's shown the whole universe that that God's great experiment would not work. That there would be no race of beings could ever be trusted to freely obey God. Left to themselves, they'll always disobey, even in paradise. Even when everything is perfect. We've often heard, you know, kind of uh, the saying that if we could just put someone in the right atmosphere. No, they were in the right atmosphere. They chose sin. They chose the fall of man. And so that's kind of, that's when this verse comes onto the scene. It's right at the, at the stench of this sin, right when wickedness has entered in, you begin to see this prophecy. But let's notice those that are involved in this context. As God surveys the moral wreckage of the fall, he immediately begins to pass judgment in this chapter. He begins where the sin began with the sermon, sermon, with his sermon to the serpent. Later, he's going to come to the woman and then to the man, but he speaks to the serpent first. Look at verse number 14 of the text. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. 
and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Although you may not recognize it at first glance, this verse, these verses are actually not directed at you and directed at me. Now, certainly they apply to us, but God is the speaker and the serpent is the one that is being spoken to. In the first two verses, God here of his sermon, he passes judgment on the serpent. It is his part in the fall of humanity. First, he's cursed above any of the other animals, right? He's now to crawl on his belly and he is going to breathe dust for the rest of his life. The bad news for the serpent is that there's no good news for him. God does not ask him what he did or why he did it because the Lord has already judged Satan when he cast him out of heaven the first time with the fall of one third of the angels that are now in this demonic realm. There's no extenuating circumstances to consider. There's no motions to file. There's no high-priced lawyers. You are condemned. The judgment is being given to the serpent. And so even though verse 15 contains the first mention of the gospel, there's no ray of hope, no hope of salvation, because the serpent is forever excluded from God's plan of salvation. So for the serpent, there's only a curse. There's only public judgment. Charles Spurgeon says this, but now God comes in takes up the quarrel personally and causes him to be disgraced only the very battlefield upon which he had gained a temporary success so in many ways the fall genesis 3 adam and eve taking of that forbidden fruit they could eat of any of the trees in the garden but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan comes along, tempts him, says you can be like God, your eyes can be enlightened, you can be open, you can be wise like God, if you'll just take of this. And we know that Eve took of it, gave it to her husband, um, uh, Adam, that was with him, that was with her, and then the fall of man. And so it is right at that time, the fall marks Satan's finest moment. When he deceived Eve, and when Eve gave that fruit to Adam, He wrecked God's plan and gained the whole world for himself. For a few short hours, minutes, we don't know how long, Satan won the great battle with God. But his victory, we know, was short-lived. Everything since then has been downhill for him. God judged them. So the time of this prophecy is right after the fall. And the people involved are Satan, and then, of course, also Adam and Eve. And we're going to get to that here in a moment. And so let me say, secondly, what does this verse predict? When we, when we understand the context, when we, when we consider verse number 15, we need to begin to ask, what does this predict for Satan, and what does it predict for us? So those that are, that, that, that are a part of this context, those that are a part of this scenario, what does it predict for Satan, and what does it predict for you and predict for me? Well, let's go back and read the verse again. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. There are, in that one verse right there, there are three levels of enmity. So when it speaks of enmity here, there are three different levels. There's three different fashions of that, of that enmity here. The first, it says, is enmity between the devil and the woman. Now, what, what, what does that mean? Well, it means that Satan, hear me, Satan and the human race the seed of the woman, so Satan, because again, he's, when he says you, he's speaking to, the sermon is to Satan, so to speak. He's speaking to him, so there's going to be enmity between you and the seed of the woman. So the devil and the, the woman. So that's the human race and Satan are going to be arch enemies. Now that might not sound like such a good plan to you. On the surface, 
It doesn't sound like a great plan of redemption to us if the first thing that God does is make us enemies to Satan. But I want you to consider the alternative. The alternative would be to be friends with Satan and therefore permanent enemies of God. So God is saying that humanity here, it still belongs to Him. Satan cannot steal away these image bearers, these creatures. They still belong to God. So enmity with God's enemy is a good thing. This is a beautiful promise that you are going to be at enmity. You're going to be at odds with Satan. It means that you are not friends, in a sense, with him. But there's a second level of enmity, and that is between the woman's offspring, the seed, and the serpent's offspring. So this is a pronouncement that humanity is going to be divided into two camps. One is called the seed of the woman, and the other is called the seed of the serpent. Now, of course, everyone is physically a seed of our, 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 the first mother, Eve. A absolutely. So physically, all of us are. But, eventually, but, but spiritually, there are those that are going to be of the seed of the serpent. That means that they will, like Satan, not obey God, but will throughout their lives fall for the deceits of the devil. But there's a third level of enmity here, and it's the most crucial, and that is between Jesus and Satan. I want to show you this verse again. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, right? So the human race and, and, and Satan, and between thy seed and and her seed. So there's a, there's a line of the serpent, and then there's the line of mankind. So there's going to be two, two, different, uh, two different enmity there. And notice what it says, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Suddenly, God is not talking about a group of people. He's now no longer talking about a line of descendants. Instead, he's speaking about one descendant who will deliver the fatal blow to the devil. And it's going to end this enmity. Did you see it there? He's using here third person plural. He's using a it or, or he and, and his. So out of the woman's seed will arise one man, this singular one man who will crush the head of Satan, thereby ridding creation of the deceiver that initiated the whole mess. However, this one seed is not going to come out of the battle unscathed. His heel is going to get struck. And so who is this seed of the woman that is being prophesied here? It is Jesus. Let me show you in Colossians 2. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So here's what Paul is saying in those first two lines there. Prior to your salvation, you were dead in your sins and you were not cut away from that old man. Circumcision is the, the cutting away, right? So he's saying you're, you're uncircumcised in that. You've not been cut away from that old man. So can I put it in today's vernacular? Here's what Paul's saying. When you were lost, right? So it says here, and you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcised your flesh, hath he quickened with him, been made alive, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Now, how did he do that? Verse 14 blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled the principalities and powers, he showed of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In what? In the cross. Hebrews 2 verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Here's what the author of Hebrews is saying. He's saying, just like your flesh and blood, Jesus Christ also became flesh and blood. He was 100% God and 100% man. He took on that flesh and blood. Why? That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were of all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
So Jesus is that promised seed of the woman. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. But, and he's going to, he's going to crush his head through the cross here. But we know that Satan has his seed as well throughout history in every generation, in every country, in every city, in every village, in every tribe and clan, in every extended family. Satan has had his people. The line started with Cain, who killed Abel and goes to the wicked generation of Noah's day. Down to Pharaoh who opposed Moses and the Canaanites who mocked Joshua. It includes all the pagan people of the old, old representation of Goliath who laughed at David and David's God. Who was it that threw Daniel into the lion's den? Who hated the prophets and murdered them in the cold blood? It was the ungodly line of Satan. Then we come to the days of Jesus when he was born. Herod tried to kill him. When he grew up, the Pharisees opposed him and they plotted to kill Jesus. Satan even in, 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 in infiltrated his inner circle and filled the heart of Judas with evil. When Jesus was arrested, men stood in line to lie about him. When Pilate offered release and he says, I find no fault in this, the bloodthirsty crowd was saying, give us Barabbas instead of Jesus. Matthew Henry said, it was the devil that put it into the heart of Judas to betray Christ, of Peter to deny him, of the chief priests to prosecute him, of the false witness to accuse him, and of Pilate to condemn him, aiming in all this by destroying the Savior to ruin the salvation. Who was behind the crucifixion of Jesus? It was the ungodly line of Satan. This is the real conflict of the ages, the struggle between those who believe in God and those who do not. So beginning with Genesis 3, there's now this fundamental division in mankind. There's this division. Francis Schaeffer speaks of the two humanities. He says this, From this time on, in the flow of history, there are two humanities. The one humanity says there is no God, or it makes God into its own imagination, or it tries to come to God in its own way. The other humanity comes to the true God in God's way. There is no neutral ground. So the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent have opposed each other continuously across the centuries. The struggle continues. It's, it's present in this day. The striking down of the seed of the woman is just a temporary defeat. Let's look at verse 15 again. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, if you've ever had a heel spur, or you've ever had maybe an Achilles problem, then you know how painful this can be. It's normally something that, you know, you've got to maybe have surgery or you can, you know, you've got to ice it. You've got to maybe be on crutches, but it's not a, it's not a fatal blow. It's not something that uh, it doesn't, um, it's not something that that will kill you. You can live with heel problems, even though you have to hobble around a little bit. But when our text says he will strike his heel, it has a couple implications for you and for me. First, it reflects to the fact that this li in this life, Satan, he sometimes wins the battle. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes he wins the battle. He has many tools in his arsenal and he shoots them at God's people 24 hours a day. Sometimes we're wounded by discouragement, criticism, anger, bitterness, or perhaps by plans that go astray, dreams that never come true, projects that never come to fruition, goals that somehow are frustrated despite our best efforts. If you want proof that Satan wins a temporary victory, visit a cemetery. Every grave testifies of his power. We all will spend some time there eventually. So the text reminds us that the Christian life it's not a bed of roses. Not only is there continual conflict, but the bad guy wins a fair number of battles. But there's another meaning here. When Christ died on the cross, Satan struck his heel. 
See, on Friday, about sundown, when they took the dead body of Jesus down from the cross, it appeared that Satan had won the battle. But come Sunday morning, the true victor walked out of the grave alive and from the dead. I want you to listen to these, these colorful words of Spurgeon. I love it. Look at your master and your king upon the cross, all stained with blood and dust. There was his heel most cruelly bruised. When they t take down the precious body and wrap it in fair white linens and in spices and lay it in Joseph's tomb, they weep as they handle the casket in which the deity had dwelt. For there again, Satan had bruised his heel. The devil had let loose Herod and Pilate and Caiaphas and the Jews and the Romans. That is all, however. It is only his heel, not his head, that is bruised. For lo, the champion rises again. And so Satan, he, he delivers that blow, but he only delivers it to his heel. Because that, would, that, that was on Good Friday, and no doubt it was, seemed to be a knockout punch. Right? The disciples, they're, all those, they're, 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 they're fearful. They're, not, they're wondering what's going on. They're rejecting, in a sense, in their mind of questioning everything that God's done. But he strikes his heel only. As painful as it was, the suffering was nothing compared to what Jesus did to Satan. Again, in the verse, verse 15, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now let's comp comp compare these two phrases for a moment. The heel versus the head. See, when Jesus died on the cross, it delivered a crushing blow to Satan. It literally crushed his head. Who do you think won the battle? Jesus or Satan? Heel wounds are painful, but they don't kill you. No one survives a crushed head. The cross was God's death blow against Satan. It was kind of the, it was the payback for the fall. And so when Jesus died and he rose again from the dead, he utterly defeated Satan. Phillips Brooks shows how Jesus won this battle while he was dying. He was wounded sorely, a life all torn and bleeding. He dragged out to the end. But when the end came, it was victorious. Look at him on the cross. Sin has taken the Savior and fastened him there. It has driven in the nails and crowded down the crown of thorns upon the forehead. It has seemed to have its own way with him. And all the while with those hands closing in agony over the nails, he is crushing its life out. Sin is tormenting him, but he is vanquishing sin. And that was prophesied, my friends, right after sin came into the world. God is for you. He's for you. Christmas is awesome because it's the fulfillment of what God was saying was going to happen. It was the start of that fulfillment, that perfect life that was going to be lived Now, to say it the way Phillips Brooks just said it, if Satan has been crushed, why does he still seem to be doing so well 2,000 years later? We know that Satan is indeed alive and well on the planet Earth. So how can a defeated being who was crushed by Christ exercise so much power? Well, the answer is, is that the cross, that at the cross, Satan was judged and his sentence was pronounced. However, he is now free to roam in power. He's still the prince and power of the air. This is kind of still his dominion here. And he's simply just awaiting his final execution. So the closer we get to that final execution, you can just imagine how bad it's going to get. It's going to get worse and worse the closer he gets. He already knows Satan knew exactly what God meant when he cursed him on that day, that he ultimately was going to be judged for all of eternity in hell. But in the end, he's going to be destroyed. And anyone that follows him is also going to be destroyed. Context. Right after sin. The, how it plays out, this enmity between 
us and Satan, between the two seeds, and of course, ultimately between Jesus and Satan. Say, Ryan, it's 2022. How does that apply to us? How do you, how do, how can you apply this to our own day, today? Let me start off by saying a Christian life will always be a struggle. It's always going to be a struggle. Struggle implies effort, sweat, exertion, and difficulty. That's why Paul uses the image of the Christian life as being a runner or a wrestler, a boxer, or a soldier in 2 Timothy chapter 2. The Christian life, it's not easy. It's hard work that demands your full commitment and the full engagement of your soul. Until the day you die, you are going to struggle. Aren't you glad you came to church today? I actually should encourage you. Like, listen, we're going to struggle. The Christian life, it's going it's to be a struggle. We're going to struggle against temptations. Sometimes you're going to win. Hallelujah for that. And sometimes you're going to lose. Don't get discouraged because the Christian life, it's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. We are at war. We've been left here to war. Life is hard, sometimes difficult. The enemy attacks on every side. Salvation is free, but the earthly ride to heaven is going to be difficult. So we learned that from the beginning. Yeah, salvation is awesome, but to gain that salvation, there's got to be a bruising of the heel. There's got to be a cross. There's got to be hardship. Let me give you another way to apply it. Our victories will not come without wounds. Hear me. If it pleased the Lord to bruise his own son, it's the Hebrew word bruise daka. If it pleased the Lord to crush his own son, for you, Isaiah 53 says, his very own son allowed that, then listen, we're not going to be able to go through this life without our wounds as well. If Jesus suffered in doing the will of God, so will we. At the cross, Satan struck a blow and wounded Christ in his heel. And even at his resurrection, his body bore, even after, his body bears the marks of his suffering. The same is going to be true for us. You will struggle hard in this life. And in struggling, you will be wounded. Please do not make the mistake of looking at other lives and thinking, oh, well, you know, look how bad I have it, and they don't. Listen, you know what your eyes see in other people? You see their best. Because often we put up the best. Often we allow people to see the best. Often the deep, dark corners of despair and crying and weeping at night, often we don't always let everyone else see that. So do not make the mistake of using your, your eyes to look at another individual and say, oh, but they, they don't have it like me. It's different, but it's hard. It's a struggle. There's wounds. Do not despair that life is hard for you. Phillips Brooks again, he says this, he is a foolish dreamer who expects an easy and bloodless victory for any noble plan. But yet success waits before every good cause if it can only preserve and struggle on with its wounded heel. So there's no victory without wounding. No progress without pain. How, how do we apply this Genesis 3.15 from 2,000 years ago? Or more than that, but it being started to be fleshed out in Christ's life. How, how, how do we apply that? That we're going to have wounds in our victories. And that life is going to be a struggle. And then let me say thirdly, God's plan of salvation is wrapped in a person. It's wrapped in a person. Genesis 3.15 is the first mention of the gospel in the entire Bible. You might have missed it because the name Jesus is not in the text. But he is there nonetheless. Jesus, the seed of the woman who would one day make his entrance into this world is the most in the most unlikely fashion. As the centuries rolled on, Satan kept winning victory after victory and God kept raising up men and women who would continue the godly line on the earth. I like to think of it kind of like as the top of a funnel. 
when this promise was given, it was simply this champion was going to come from the seed of the woman. It was going to come from all of humanity. It's like a, it's like a really super wide beginning of the funnel. But after the flood, the line was narrowed to Noah's descendants, then later to Shem's descendants, then later came to rest on one man, Abraham, the father of the nation Israel, then to his son Isaac, and to Isaac's son Jacob, to Jacob's son Joseph, and then to Joseph's son Judah. Centuries later, this line would ultimately be narrowed down to the house of David. Finally, some nine centuries after that, the line would come to rest on the firstborn son of a virgin named Mary. What started with this whole human race has now narrowed to just one man, Jesus Christ. He didn't come in the usual way. He came by means of a virgin birth. No one before or since will ever enter into this world like he did. Thus, Jesus Christ is the ultimate seed, hear that, seed of the woman. There was no man involved Because we know on science, the seed comes from the man. So when you read in Genesis 3.15, even the virgin birth is being prophesied. That the seed of the woman, beautiful. When God wanted to save the world, he didn't send a committee. He sent his son. When God wanted to say, I love you, he wrapped his love now in swaddling clothes. When God wanted to crush Satan, he started in a stable. In Bethlehem. Now, this might interest you some. John Wesley, we're going to sing this song at the end of the service, but he he wrote the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And he included a verse that isn't often included in the modern hymn books. And the verse goes like this Come, desire of nations, come, fix in us thy humble home. Rise, the woman's conquering seed, bruise in us the serpent's head. Adam's likeness now efface, stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. We don't sing that one, but that's good. Goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. But I want to close this morning. You say, Pastor, you preached long enough. There's no clock in the back, so I have no clue what time it is. We should do that more often. I want to end by asking you three questions. First question is, is have you accepted Christ as your Savior? And if you have, it started right after the fall of this plan. And we really, you look at scriptures before the foundation of the world. But you see right after the stench of sin, right after it, God says, all right, I'm going to begin to show grace. I'm going to begin to advance towards you. Christmas is awesome. Easter's great too. It's all one beautiful circle. But have you accepted Christ as your Savior or are you still on the way? Some of you are still on the way. You're still on the way towards Christ. And as you hear these words, you realize that step by step, you're coming closer. You're coming closer to the moment of decision. So have you trusted him? Or are you still on your way? Second question is, if you're still on the way, where are you on your spiritual journey at this moment? Are you still really, really far away? from God and not not fully understanding, you're, you're kind of uninterested, or do you find yourself being drawn to the Lord? Is He drawing you to the Lord even this morning? Question one, do you know Christ is your Savior? Does that fire you up when you see it come full circle? Or are you on your way? And if you're on your way, where are you at? on that journey. And then my third question is, is are you ready to receive Christ as the Savior of the world? Because no decision is more important. And no one else can make it for you. I would love to make it for you, but I actually can't. I actually, in my own power, have no power whatsoever to draw you to Christ. The Holy Spirit does that. 
And if he's drawing you, the decision is now. You trust Christ as your Savior. You ask him to forgive you of your sin. You acknowledge, Lord, I am separated from you. I'm, I, I'm a great sinner, but Christ, you came through a virgin birth. Why? So someday your heel would be bruised. You would die on a cross some 33 and a half years later for humanity, salvation. And you accept that by faith. You say, Ryan, that, that doesn't make any sense. That's the avenue that God has given us for salvation. It's not by our works. It's not by going to church. It's not by giving money. It's not by helping people cross the street. It's not by any of that. God said the way to heaven, his avenue, his object of salvation is Jesus Christ on the cross, dying for our sins. And then three days later, rising from the dead in power. Here's what the Bible says. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Faith. You've got to believe in what Christ has done for you. So where are you at? Have you trusted him? Then let this Christmas be awesome as we see Jesus from the very beginning preparing for that first Christmas. Or if you're somewhere on this journey, where are you? Are you still far from him? Are you still resisting him? Or are you sensing that you're coming closer and closer and closer? You know what the next step is for you? Faith, trusting Christ. That he is the one that can restore us with God the Father. The seed of the woman. Beautiful story. Jesus Christ, who was actually part of creation too, but you see him right after the fall being prophesied to come onto the scene because he's for you. Don't ever doubt that. Some of us are doubting if God's good, doubting if he's really for us. He is for you. And he showed that thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. Every head bowed, every eye closed.